Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets what? Deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, the first guide of funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be glad you did, and I'll be glad too. As always, whether you're watching to our video program on YouTube or FunkinStuff.net or listening to the podcast version on iTunes or from other leading providers, very much thank you for the continued interest and support. This episode features Gregory Williams, who founded, produced, arranged, composed, and played keyboards and horns for one of the most successful R&B groups of the late 1970s and early 1980s. I'm talking about Switch. Founded in Ohio in 1976 and discovered by mentor, producer, and composer Jermaine Jackson in 1977, the sextet was signed to and groomed by Motown under the supervision of Barry Gordy. The lineup included Bobby and Tommy DeBarge of the later famous DeBarge family, as well as Philip Ingram, whose brother James Ingram later gained fame as a soul singer. Williams, Bobby DeBarge, and another Switch member, Jody Sims, first recorded professionally in 1975 as Barry White Protégés, releasing an album under the name White Heat. Almost a year in the making, Switch's self-titled debut in 1978 took radio, record stores, and hearts by storm. It included the top 10 R&B smash There Will Never Be, which also cracked the pop top 40. The band was particularly noteworthy for its tight instrumentation, group vocals, and harmonies especially Bobby DeBarge's soaring falsetto. While Switch's biggest hits tended toward the mellow and melodic, the group also laid down some catchy up-tempo R&B and funk. I can vouch firsthand how inescapable Switch was on radio, at house parties, in the clubs. Their smooth and soulful sound was ubiquitous in the late 1970s and early 80s. All told, the group produced six albums, five of them during 1978 to 1981 for Motown, and the final last gasp was Total Experience Records in 1984. The last two were without the DeBarges, who had left to work with their siblings and other projects. And the final album was also without Ingram, who had left to pursue his own solo career. The first four albums made the R&B Top 25, and Switch's hits and notable songs included I Want to Be Closer, Best Beat in Town, I Call Your Name, Love Over and Over Again, We Like to Party, Come On, Go On Doing What You Feel, Power to Dance, You Keep Me High, and Just Can't Pull Away. Switch has been credited as influencing subsequent self-contained R&B bands like Tony, 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 and Mink Condition. In this in-depth interview, William Shearer Switch's path to success, talks about the albums and songs, the breakup, subsequent musical and life pursuits, and reuniting the group, to bring the switch sound to audiences today. Now, speaking of switches, we're gonna switch the scenes on you a little bit during the interview because we did have some technical challenges and things shift around a bit. And there are a few parts where the audio gets a little, you know, but hang with it. The story unfolds, you'll be glad you did. Apologize for those technical challenges, but we take them as they come. And so with that, is it last time to flip the switch and mix it up? with Mr. Gregory Williams. I'm so very pleased to welcome to Truth and Rhythm, Mr. Gregory Williams, founder, producer, composer, keyboardist, and horn player for the smooth R&B band Switch, which set both hearts and dance floors of fire in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Greg, thank you so much for joining me. Scott, thanks so much for having me. I've, I've been looking forward to this. So hopefully all goes well and we can uh, have a champagne, a, a ghost of a champagne afterwards or something. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so um, been a fan from way back, you know, and uh, so it's, it's a great thrill to finally get to speak to you directly. And you're coming to us uh, from where today? Los Angeles area, actually Northridge, a uh, suburb right outside of LA. Oh yeah, well, I graduated from CSUN, so I know it well. Oh, really? That's right. I think we did touch on that. That's right down the street from where I am. A few blocks, anyway. 
Yeah. Were you there during the earthquake or not that long? It sure was. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> Actually, I was in the city. I was. I had my home in Northridge, but I was in the city at the time, the morning of it. And God, when I got back to my house, my neighborhood had fallen completely apart. So it was really crazy. We had to rescue people from falling refrigerators and locked doors and you know, fortunately, I was I wasn't caught up, but I did come back to wreckage and all of that. It was a hell of a time. So yeah, yeah, yeah that was something else, boy. You rock and roll with it. You kind of get used to it after a while. Yeah, yeah, you do. It's a way of life. Speaking of that, Switch was a way of life uh, for R and B radio in the late seventies and early eighties, and uh, man, so many great songs and albums we're going to get into. I'm real excited about Album. that. All right, Greg, so are you ready to talk some uh, Switch history and uh, a little bit about your background? Absolutely. All right. So got to start way back. Where from originally? Did you have a musical childhood? How did you first get into music? Absolutely. Believe it or not, man, I started singing and performing. Oh, God, three years old. Me and my little cousins to get together and sing. I'm from a musical family, basically. My mom was a gospel singer, not noted, uh, local gospel singer. My dad was a saxophonist. And uh, actually, he did get a little headway. He played with Al Green and a couple of other uh, noted individuals that would come through Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is where I was born. My mom, as I said, used to sing in the church. She's from a family of 11, my mother, uh, uh, with 10 siblings, and all of them were musically inclined. So. The influences were always there, up close and personal. So I did. I started as a little bitty guy, singing around the house, joining in, and uh, I did my first performance in kindergarten. I sang in a Christmas play, and got bit by the bug. And from that point on, that that's who I was, and that's what I did. I proclaimed at age six years old I was going to be an entertainer, and I stuck to that, no matter what. Do your homework. Okay, I'm going to play my music. <laughs> Get a job. Okay, but I'm going to play my music. <laughs> so, always the music. So, with that, you know, I uh, was in different bands. I started singing in kindergarten. I picked up the trumpet at age seven in school. Mm -hmm. And together, a hot five, me and four other horn players in the fourth grade doing talent shows and uh, assemblies and different things that they would let us do. That's cool. I involved in the various R&B singing groups, singing and stepping groups, all of Temptations, you know, bands where, you know, of course, you know, horn sections were, you know, the thing back then. So here I am, trumpet player playing with a lot of them. So I was in six bands, actually, before I put Switch together. Okay, in 1973, uh, I got a call while I'm in college, sophomore year, and uh, I got a call and a friend of mine who I'd grown up playing with had left a couple years ago with a group out of Ohio called TNT Flashers. Well, ironically, TNT Flashers manager was a close friend to Barry White. Barry White was working on a new production deal. This is 1973. He's working on a new production deal with RCA and he promised this guy if once that deal came through, he would sign this guy's act. So I get a call from my partner saying, hey, man, what are you doing? We need a trumpet player. Our trumpet player just quit. And uh, uh, we're about to get this deal with Barry White. We're in Phoenix, Arizona. You want to come out and join us? Well, I agreed to come out and join us on one condition. The one condition was that I was already involved. Uh, there's a long story about the DeBarge family and me, and we'll get into that uh, as you wish, I mean, as, as you call it out. But Bobby DeBarge, uh, I knew he wouldn't get out of there without me. And I told this guy, I said, if you guys can make room for Bobby to come with me, I'll come. And they did, because ironically, the keyboard player had quit too. So uh, Bobby and I left in February of 1973 and joined the guys in Phoenix, Arizona. Some six months later, uh, working in Phoenix, uh, not performing, but really just rehearsing and getting to know things and learning songs. Uh, the Barry White deal came through. We moved to California from Phoenix, mine with Barry White, uh, became White Heat, and it evolved from there. I think White Heat was together from 1970, from that 1973, 
until Barry dropped us in 1976. And after Barry dropped band, we were in Akron, Ohio as a unit. That was our home base in Akron because the uh, other guys. Can, can I jump in for a second, Greg? Sorry to interrupt you, but I want to jump in. Yes. Um, so White Heat, oh, come on. White Heat put out one record, self-titled, in 1975. And, um, you know, how how did you feel about that record? You know, were you happy with it? Uh, and how did you feel about how it was received? Uh, <laughs> okay. I was happy to do it. That was my very first record. That was my very first situation with a major label. And then, of course, to be signed with Barry, by Barry White. You know, and even though Barry was hands-on on only one song, he did oversee the project. So of course I'm loving it. I'm 19 years old. I'm excited, and it's 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 you know something awesome to behold. And once the record was released, well, okay, it took us 18 months to to record the record here in Los Angeles, and then we re relocated back in Ohio. Once the record, once we moved back there, the record was released. The record did nothing. They did not promote it. We never heard it on the radio. We just knew we had a record because they sent each of us one copy. Okay, <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, and after that, that nothing else, nothing ever happened on the record. And we were performing live as White Heat. We had uh, hopped on a Grand Central Station tour because they were brand new at the time, and on a few dates with Mandrill and we did a few dates with other people in and around the Ohio uh, Midwest area, Indiana, Kentucky, you know, Pennsylvania. And uh, as I said, record came out in 75. A year later, Barry White dropped us from the label. No fanfare, no anything. So I, I want to point out one that track. That was how that thing fell apart. And oh, I want to point out one track on there and get your uh, feedback on it. Funk Freak, which is one. Do you remember that cut? Oh. Ironically, that song we recorded on the White Heat album, it was written by Jody Sims and Stanley Brown. And then we, we, that we used to, oh man, we used to tear them up on stage with that song. So we actually wound up re-recording it again. The two subsequent albums, one being Smash and another being a Hot Ice album over in Europe. It was a hot song, it was a good song. And it was a good band song. So yeah. And then I did, other than Funk Freak, and there was something that Bobby DeBarge and I wrote, our first, uh, writing together. Uh, I've been so lonely. Other than those two songs, I didn't think a whole lot of the album, to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, we had fun recording it, but the quality of the album was subpar, which I didn't know until I got to Motown how subpar it was. So I wanted to, uh, Greg, ask you about some of your uh, influences when you first got started. Who did you look up to? And who did you admire? Because on that Funk Freak song, for example, to me, I felt like it had some Ohio players and Norman Whitfield kind of vibe. Who are some of the folks that you were sort of looking up to at that point? To be honest with you, man, I had no musical influences. I was a jazz musician, you know, as a musician, period. But all the years on my trumpet, most of the years on, I sang with R&B groups, but I played with jazz acts. And... I had, you know, everybody influenced me and nobody specifically, to be honest with you. Now, it just so happened that song Funk Freak, other than being one of the musicians involved, I wasn't involved with the production, you know, other than what the group did. But I just say the, the influence was Ohio. You say Ohio players? Well, TNT Flashers, who became White Heat, came up with Ohio players. In fact, they were actually musical rivals throughout the Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky area, you know, because both acts were, both acts were, it had built-in singers, it was self-contained. So yeah, I think they all influenced each other. I think they all compete. And then what happened between that and finding your way to switch? After Barry White dropped the group and what I believe was probably like maybe June, July of, 2006 i mean 1976 excuse me the guys left everybody in the band left i was in the house alone i worked with local bands you know just doing gigs to make a few bucks here and there to eat 
you know, fortunately, they embraced me as a young trumpet player. They welcomed me in and your jazz group for the most part. But OK, and I, that's when I decided to put my own group together. And I had been in touch with a friend who was over in Germany. And uh, when he was one, he was an accountant, actually. But he had ties to various people in the industry, and he wanted to be in the industry. And he said if he could get the money, that he would uh, give me the money to do a demo. So when he contacted me and let me know that he had a budget, that's when I put my group together. I'd already decided who I wanted in the group, the individuals, which was uh, uh, Jody Sims of White Heaton and uh, Bobby DeBarge. It wound up being Jody Sims, Bobby DeBarge, Tommy DeBarge, Philip Ingram, and Eddie Fluellen, and myself. But uh, I had guys from the area that I'd picked to be in, and different things happened and fell apart and came back together. But ultimately, uh, uh, that's when I pull switch together. We cut a demo in Ohio. It, I pulled everybody from their hometowns into Mansfield, Ohio, where we rented a house and were isolated for the most part, you know, uh, so we could concentrate. We uh, honed our crabs on our, our demos. And we cut it, took us uh, nine days to cut the demo. After that, uh, Jody Sims and I came out to Los Angeles with it shopping and uh, by chance met Jermaine Jackson and his wife, Hazel Gordy Jackson, in an elevator. We had one tape. We left Ohio with one cassette, if you can believe that, hoping to get more later if we needed it. But we were just trying to shop a deal with one tape. <laughs> and as Good fortune would have it. We met Jermaine and Hazel, and uh, we actually gave them our tape. See, our plan was anybody that listened to our tape had to listen to it with us because it was the only one we had. Something told us to give them that tape. We gave them that tape. Jermaine called in less than 24 hours and told me that he liked the tape and what we want to do. I told him, well, we want a deal. And he asked, we meet him right then. And uh, we did. He was at uh, he was uh, at a hospital not far from us with his wife Hazel. She was pregnant. I felt to say, so she was in labor. While she was in labor, he was standing there, alone, facing the floors. He called us, and uh, we joined him. And uh, we talked and got acquainted, and you know, uh, talked about. He talked about the fact that he and his wife Hazel were just starting a new management company since his brothers were already gone from Motown, and he was there alone as an artist. He was working on his album, but he and she started a management company. They were looking for some, they were considering some new music and new people to sign anyway. So we came up at a perfect time. And since they liked our stuff, they wanted, uh, they said that they'd help us get a deal at Motown. And uh, they did. And the rest basically on that is pretty much history. Wow. Well, that was fortuitous. You know, it's one of those great timing stories. Everything fell in place. Um, what um where where were you guys staying you know while you're out there and how were you kind of getting by uh until things really clicked into place check this out ironically when the group white heat broke up the same guy my dear brother darnell wyrick who was also raised in grand rapids michigan and who i had been with for different bands throughout the years who also had been my college roommate until he left to join White Heat. Well, he and his, he came back to L.A. When the group dispersed, he moved back to L.A. He and his girlfriend had an apartment. Jody and he let Jody and I, they let Jody and I stay in their apartment while we tried to get situated and get a deal. So we had enough money to catch buses and we did a lot of walking. And it was like nine days we hadn't been in town two weeks. We hadn't been in town two weeks and when we ran into Jermaine. Actually, we ran into Jermaine the second week we were there in that elevator. And from that point, Motown, after Jermaine uh, uh, introduced it to Motown, and Motown said, let's sign them, they actually took over. They put Jody and myself in a hotel, and they gave us per diems. So we didn't have any problems. And uh, we, as we made plans to get the rest of the guys, fly the rest of the guys out, from, uh, oh, well, not fly them, but bus them, because they got Greyhound buses from Ohio to to us. So that's how we were able to sustain. It was only a few weeks and all in total before Motown took over anyway. At, at what point did you say, or did you ever say, uh, excuse me, Mr. Jackson, can we have our wind tape back? 
<laughs> want to hear something funny? The first the order of the business, they offered us eight thousand dollars for the rights to the tape. <laughs> that was the first when we were signing. That was the first order of business, along with signing us as artists, as writers, as producers. They also offered us eight thousand dollars for the rights to the tape. <laughs> So, needless to say, we didn't need it back from Jermaine anyway. <laughs> and so this was like 1977? 77. We met Jermaine in February of 77. We were signed by May of 77. And how did you uh, cross paths with the DeBarge family? And what was your interaction relationship with them at that point? Well... I grew up with the DeBarge family, basically. From 15 years old, I met Bobby. I met Bunny when I was 14. I met Bobby when I was 15. We were in a little group at school. There was a group that, uh, actually, Bobby and I were more visiting all the time than actual participants. And he and I would hang out and play the piano afterwards. So, like I said, when I, it was time to go and join TNT Flash's uh, uh, White Eat. Then I took Bobby with me, and when it was time to put Switch together, I put Tommy in Switch first. So it was the DeBarge brothers, myself, Jody, Philip, and Eddie, who uh, wound up getting the deal at Motown. And from that point on, you know, it was, uh, I think it was maybe a year or so later that we did a promotional tour in the when Jermaine and Hazel met them. And certain things were initiated for them to be heard by Motown as well. And that kind of launched their history as well. So you, you came from a musical family, as you had said. So I guess you had some commonalities with them and felt a certain kinship probably, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's what brought Bobby and me together was anyway, was the music and the rest of them. When I would go hang out at the house, it was all of us. You know, it was even the little baby DeBarge kids singing with us while Bobby's playing the piano or El playing the piano and everybody's harmonizing and finding their notes. And Marty and me would trumpet. Marty was a trumpet player also, so we're playing on the trumpets, and you know. So yeah, but we were always involved uh, or frequently, shall I say, musically involved as a collective. So it was just part for the course. If one get a deal, we all got a deal. Did you have any sort of a model that you were emulating where you kind of had a vision of what Switch might be in terms of its sound and its uh, presentation? Even, yeah. Yes, sir. Even before Switch became an actual entity, I, out of all the things I did between the R&B singing and stepping groups, between the jazz bands, between the other bands and music I played, I had ideas on all of it. So in handpicking guys to put this group together, I had uh, my prerequisites were I wanted a group of guys who everyone sang and played could play at the same time. That the majority of the guys could be solo vocalists, but just the same. Everybody could harmonize and, and be the same thing, I mean, and, and sing at the same time. I wanted guys that played more than one instrument. I wanted guys that could sing. I mean, excuse me, not, uh, I wanted guys that could sing and play more than one instrument. And I wanted a group of good looking guys because the girls always fell out for the good looking guys. So I wanted that. And most of all, I wanted guys that I could get along with. I'm pretty even tempered. And I wanted guys that were like that. I didn't want no hotheads. I didn't want no drug addicts. I didn't want no fools per se. I wanted something that could work. And ultimately, that's what I wound up getting for that point in time. And what was your main like? In so what, and, 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 uh, I'm sorry, were you going to answer? A further to yeah, I was, because I didn't I didn't totally answer your question. I wanted a group that could sing like The Temptations. So I got uh, Bobby DeBarge was like an Eddie Kendricks. Philip Ingram was like a David Ruffin. And myself as a lead vocalist was more like a Paul Williams. So that took care of that vocal aspect of it. And I wanted a band that could play like Earth, Wind & Fire. And I got that out of everybody as well. So if I had to pick two entities that I was trying to emulate to a degree, that's what it was. But not musically, but just in an overall, uh, uh, overall concept. 
because I knew musically we would go wherever we went. I knew there was enough creativity in the individuals that I was asking to be a part for us to come up with some great music. And we were blessed to do just that. And so from that tape that you had, how many of those uh, songs that ended up on that first album in 78 are from that tape? You know, what was sort of the process from that tape to what went on that record? Quite frankly, it was like boot camp for a good year with us. Because after Motown signed us, they took us to school. They took us to school on a lot of levels. We were exposed to uh, recording equipment, likes that we had never seen, except with the Barry White situation, but we'd never really seen it and definitely never had the opportunity to go and play on, you know, uh, Neve consoles and 24 track machines. And, you know, because we recorded our demo on a 16 track. And, uh, we were afforded the luxury of the top flight arrangers and string players and orchestras and stuff like that. So with that, we begin to create differently and stronger. So of those eight songs on that demo, ironically, only one of them made the album. Hmm. And everything else just sits from that point to this. You know, they were all good songs. They were all great songs, but we learned that uh, great songs and great production will take you a whole lot further. And we were afforded that. So we went in and created a whole bunch of new stuff. And the stuff that we wound up with that went on the album was definitely more current and more had more production value than the stuff that we started with on the demo. So. Was it intimidating at all or just exciting? Not to me. Not intimidating in the least. And I didn't go in acting like a know-it-all either. It was just that these are my new toys to play with, and that's how we looked at it. Not right in the middle of snow. Come on. And even to be on a label with such stars as The Temptations and Stevie Wonder and Marvin was there at the time, and there was Commodores were creeping. Well, actually, they had a hit record when we signed, and there were a lot of great acts on the label at the time, but that was, to me personally, was not intimidating either. I belong here, you know. No, no, no vanity, no ego. This is just where I belong with all these creative people. So nothing was intimidating in the least. And I do have to say that Jermaine and Hazel and Barry Gordy made it easy for us too. We knew that we were Barry's kids. And once we were Barry's kids, you know, for the most part, the company bowed. So nothing was intimidating. So when you went into the studio and you had all those resources, what role did Jermaine play in the recording, if any, and also how did you guys sort of work as a unit in the studio? We would, for, for the first few months, we rehearsed. The band rehearsed in the house. Jermaine used to come over and hang out with us. So he kind of mentored us and introduced us that we didn't know about, referring to equipment, referring to uh, the different studios, referring to the engineers who does what, and things like that. And uh, so I think I just got distracted too. What was your question? Uh, about what you were like as a unit in the studio and the role that Jermaine played in that. And, and again, okay. So we would, we would rehearse and Jermaine would come and hang with us and he just kind of mentored us and exposed us. And so when we were in the studio, he was the seventh member of Switch. He would play bass. He's a cow hell of a bass player, even though Tommy was our bass player. Jermaine would play some stuff and he would sing with us. And, and you know, he wound up bringing a couple of songs and we all dove in as a unit to help make it happen. He and I wrote I Want to Be Closer, uh, which is the one one song on the album. And uh, so he would produce, he would contribute maybe a song, maybe two per album. You know, but also he was our manager, so he was overseeing and making sure things got done right. And I'm not just referring to us playing and getting the music down. I'm referring to the business as well, making sure that we had what we needed. Uh, if we needed any uh, additional equipment, if we needed another studio, if we needed other players like the orchestrators and, and uh, the big sections, horn and string sections, he made sure that uh, everything ran smoothly on that for a long time. About how long did it take you to make that first record? What's your question? 
I said about how long did it take you to make that first album? Believe it or not, we signed in there 77. I don't think the record came out until September of 78. Mm -hmm. So it took us more than a year wow. to learn, to groom. And not only did Jermaine work with us on that first record, Barry Gordy and Jeffrey Bowen. Uh, Jeffrey's biggest claim to fame at that point even though he's a part of the corporation that did music with the Jackson Five and all that, his biggest claim to fame was shaky ground for the Temptations. Mm -hmm. You know, so him and Barry team, and they worked with us as well. They produced with us as well. So Greg, let me just talk about some of the songs that were on that first record because it was a great debut, probably you know one of the best debuts of that era. Um, of course, it had the huge smash that will never be. Um, which just tore up. Was that the first single choice? And, you know, what do you remember about making that song in particular? Ironically, Del Never Be almost didn't make that album. It was the last record chosen. Reason being is because we were almost done with the album. Bobby and I lived in an apartment together in North Hollywood. And we had a piano in the living room. And, uh, you know, when we weren't working, whatever we were doing, we'd get there and we'd congregate and we'd play the piano. One night, Bobby was playing this song and it sounded really good. So I heard a little bit of it while he tried to figure it out. And then I, I wound up getting a phone call and going in another room. And he came and got me maybe about a, a half hour later and said, man, you got to hear the song. I listened to the song, fell in love with the song. I said, we need to play this for Mr. Gordy because at that time, Bear Gordy was kind of overseeing the project as well. Jermaine was the day-to-day -day oversee, but Barry was, it was his baby, it was his project. So we called him and we played it for him. And he said, it's a smash. He said, you guys need to cut that. Wait, I'll call you back. He hung up. He called us about an hour later and he said, can you guys go in the studio in the morning? I just made the arrangements for you to go in. You And he gave us the name and number of the person to call and we called and uh, next day we went in the studio cutting the song. And there had already been, the album was done basically. There was a song called You're the One For Me, which still wound up on the When They'll Never Be was completed, You're the One For Me got booted to the side and They'll Never Be wound up being our first single. So, how was your how did you feel and how was the group's reaction when you first heard on the radio and then when it started taking off uh, the most amazing thing let me share this with you uh, uh scott see the individuals that i picked are hum humble individuals they were not ego and vain driven initially you know not that they were later on either there were a couple things that happened that you know uh uh ego when ego came to play later but to question we were actually shocked and blown away when we first heard our record on the radio. We didn't expect this. Along with hearing the record on the radio, I think even before hearing the record on the radio, there were pictures of us on uh, bus benches and billboards and on the side of buses and the little banners that are on the, the, the top of taxi cabs. There's our first album cover. If you remember it, there's a strip of pictures across the top of all six of us. Well, that strip of pictures is what was on the bus benches, on the poster, uh, on the, the, the sides of the buses, on the billboards that was all throughout Los Angeles. Come to find out that it was in other parts of the country, too. We didn't know. But... So we saw those before we heard the record. And when we finally heard the record, we were just outdone. You know, I think maybe Philip and I were together and, and the others were in different places or whatever. But of course, we, everybody immediately got home so we could call each other to talk about we heard the record. Everybody was elated and, and, you know, still a group of humble, not really knowing how big that record would become. It took a year or more for us to know how big that record had become and how big the group had become. It took us going to an in-store in in a so it took a minute for it to sink in just happy man just thankful that you know we had an opportunity to do that did you go out and uh tour much based on just that first record if so who'd you go out with and did you uh, do some tv appearances we did, we did a lot of television i was just making note of that earlier for uh, a documentary that i, I need to do uh 
We did Merv Griffin. We did Rock Concert. We did Miss USA Pageant. We did the Hollywood Christmas Parade. We did a lot of different things. First album, uh, a lot of television. But we did not switch, did not go out until 1981. Hmm. We had four records under our belt. We did not go out until then. Initially, it was a... Uh, uh, it was an intentional thing with Barry and Jermaine and Hazel. They didn't want Switch. They knew that Switch was big and getting bigger. And they didn't want us to go out until they wanted us to do like the Jackson Five. Hold off, hold off, hold off. Then you go out making $25,000 a night. You know, so uh, they held us the first album. They held back the second album. They held the third album. I'm still saying my group needs to go out. But them being my managers and them having the plan and pulling the first strings and the contact, it didn't happen until, like I said, the fourth album, when I had to insist, y'all got to let us go out. So, 